a very warm welcome. It's the 134th Security Thought Leadership Webinar. And uh, we've been here for 133 times before, examining a topic of relevance to the security world. And the idea of thought leadership is that we critique today what is going on in order that we get a better type of security tomorrow. So the idea is not trying to solve the world problems, we're trying to give ideas, thoughts, issues, ways of thinking about things that enable us to think differently and in a more informed way. And today's topic, now often I say, this emerges from previous webinars, and it sort of does. It's called Thinking About Security as a Science, how developed is the body of knowledge? But I've got to tell you, a chap called Andre Philippe Rodriguez from uh, Portugal wrote to me and said, this is a really important topic. Um, I don't want to be on the panel, but uh, I do think it's something that you should be doing. And uh, his point is that science is fundamental to the way that we run our life. It's fundamental to security. We need to take it seriously. And there are question marks about the extent to which we do and how we do that. So. In a second, what I'll do is I'll interview, uh, introduce our, uh, I'll invite our panelists to introduce themselves. And then once they've done that, I will then invite uh, uh, you, the, them to make a, an opening statement, and then you to ask any questions that you want. If you do audience want to ask questions, please use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen, and I will endeavor to incorporate you in the ensuing discussion. So please make sure you get the question in as early as you can. Without further ado then, let's uh, go and meet our panelists. And first of all, all the way over near Washington in the United States of America, Kevin, please say hello. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Peterson, uh, as, as Martin said, based in the US. Uh, I'm uh, a, uh, a, a security risk management consultant, but also an, an adjunct professor and the program lead at Webster University uh, for business and organizational security management. And I've been doing that for about 20 years. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Kevin. And um, I'm become a bit nearer to home for me anyway in the UK to say hello to Brian. Brian. Hello, Martin. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Waters. I'm an as as Associate Professor of Defence Leadership and Management at Cranfield University, uh, where I run a series of master's degrees and an international programme on strategic leadership. Uh, this year, we've done it virtually, of course. Uh, normally, we would travel to 16 countries across the world to deliver it on behalf of the British Fom Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and the MOD. And um, prior to my academic career, which has been going on for 12 years, uh, I was in the British Army for 37 years um, and commanded from second lieutenant to brigadier uh, across um, all parts of the world that the British Army has been engaged in, uh, notably in Central America, uh, the Balkans, um, Iraq, um, Rhodesia down in Africa. So quite a broad experience trying to understand what security is and trying to implement it. Brian and Kevin, thank you very much indeed. Well, clearly, two panellists who've got um, extensive experience in uh, a different type of security in the military and who are both researchers. So a very, very, very good background to talk about uh, the science of security. So let's hear what they've got to say then. In their opening statement, they get three minutes to give us their views on this subject matter. They can say what they like on the subject. Let's go to Kevin first. Kevin, your opening statement, please. All right, thank you, Martin. Uh, as Martin laid out for the, the basis for this uh, uh, program today, um, uh, we're talking about security as a science and, and sort of the introduction or lead into that is the whole concept of body of knowledge. Uh, and I know there's a lot of controversy over that. There's been for many years. Uh, I'm a firm believer that our body of knowledge is fairly well developed in this. Uh, and uh, I, I found an article in, in, in looking, uh, uh, sort of preparing for this, it's kind of interesting talking about body of knowledge, but it's, it's actually from the financial world and it's talking about the um, certified financial analyst program. And it makes some good points. First of all, it calls body of knowledge sort of a common ground that everybody can sort of buy into or rally around. I, I believe that very firmly. It also says that the body of knowledge is oftentimes uh, developed in, in many fields uh, by a professional or a number of professional associations because that's where the subject matter expertise comes together. So I think that's very relevant. It also relates body of knowledge to 
uh, to competencies that people need to exhibit within that profession. And finally, it talks about the fact that uh, body of knowledge is, is a living thing. It's, it's evolving. It's not something that's static. So I think all of this is very, very relevant to the, to the field of security. Um, and, um, and that's why I'm, I, I'm a big believer also in the fact that we are definitely a profession. Uh, there's a lot of you know, uh, people in, in our community that believe one way or the other. I, I'm convinced that we are definitely a, a well-grounded profession. Uh, and, and we need to kind of proceed from that, that uh, assumption, I guess. So uh, I believe um, that uh, especially security, and, and we need to look at two things. We need to look at security as a function. We also need to look at security management and make a distinction between the two. So both are very relevant. Um, and they're both a combination of science and art. Um, and... Uh, I wanted to touch on some pros and cons of, of the science of security. And in, in terms of the pros, I believe it's important because uh, with, as a science, we can apply a, a process mentality to security and to security management as well uh, and, and follow that scientific method where we make observations, we develop hypotheses, we test and, and experiment on those hypotheses draw conclusions that we can then apply uh, in various circumstances. So that scientific method is very, very relevant to the field of security and the field of security management. In terms of the cons, uh, I, I'm afraid that sometimes when we talk about science, we, we have a tendency to view things as black and white. And that is absolutely not the case in the world of security. Um, we, we really need to tailor things to specific environments, to specific situations, to specific uh, uh, locations, places, and times. Uh, and, and we don't want to get bogged down in this idea that it's either this way or this way, black and white. Uh, secondly, sometimes when we talk about science, unfortunately, uh, we, we tend to believe that the science comes from the people who are the loudest voices in the room or the most overbearing people. And that can very easily happen. So uh, I think we need to be very, very careful that we actually implement a scientific method rather than just listening to the loudest people in the room, which sometimes in the world of security we do. Um, and uh, finally, uh, sometimes the, the last con I think is sometimes science is sort of in the eye of the beholder. Uh, and, and I think we've seen some of this actually around the world in, in, our, with, in our experience with COVID that, well, th this is my science, so that's the science. And, oh, tomorrow it's a different science. And so, so we have to be very careful about, again, sticking to that scientific method and being uh, loyal to or faithful to science when we talk about security or security management as a science. Last thing uh, Martin wanted us to look at is how can we make or, or uh, push uh, the, the idea of science uh, in, in the security world. And I think there's two, uh, a couple of important things. One, I think we need to get together and have some sort of a, a conversation, uh, whether that's a working group or, or whatever on lexicon. Words are important. And I think one of our downfalls in the security management world is that we have, there's disagreements about what different terms and different words mean. And I think a number of different professional associations should get together, uh, ideally, I think, led by ASIS International, and just talk about that topic of lexicon so we can get more on the same sheet of music that will help us advance more towards a scientific uh, arena in terms of, of uh, security. Um, and, uh, and I think we really need an initiative, a specific initiative. The problem is who would do that and how, but some sort of an initiative to advance science uh, in the field of security and security management, I think would be fantastic. So that's, that's my introductory comments, Martin, and uh, I, I hope, uh, hope everyone uh, enjoyed that. 
Thank you very much indeed. I enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Kevin. Just to say to people, if you'd like to get your questions in, please use the question and answer button at the bottom of your screen. And as soon as we've heard from Brian, I'll come and uh, uh, try and involve you in the ensuing discussion. So without further ado then, uh, let's go to Brian. And Brian, can we have your thoughts on this subject? Yeah, uh, well, Kevin's a tough act to follow. Um, and I, I, I don't want to be repetitive. A little bit of what I was going to say is, is, is slightly echoing uh, what Kevin said. Um, as a, a former soldier, one of the, the foundation books I read was by a guy called Karl von Clausewitz um, on war, von Krieg, written in 1832, and arguably still very relevant today. Um, in uh, chapter three of book two, it is called Art or Science of War. And he says some quite interesting things that are relevant, I think, to our discussion today. Um, he, he says, that in a word, if it is impossible to imagine a human being possessing merely the faculty of cognition, devoid of judgment, or the reverse, so also art and science can never be completely separated from each other. He is talking about war. Today we might call war studies security studies. Um, and so I would totally and wholeheartedly agree with Clausewitz that in my studies and my practical application of war and of peace, um, I have found it is a match between art and science. Um, and even in science, we, we've got to talk about what sort of science we're we talking about. Are we talking about a sort of positivist approach? There is one truth um, and we will use a, a quantitative method. We'll use numbers to calculate the truth. Or are we talking about a sort of constructionist? You know, does security sit as a social science? Most people generally believe it does. Uh, and so maybe it's a, a constructionist approach. There are multiple truths. And the problem for the practitioner is understanding the truth they're grappling with. Um, and, and I don't think that, that science has a, a great benefit unless it's practically applicable to the practitioner. Um, so as a practitioner, I use science for sense making, for, for using scientific frameworks to enable me to make sense of a problem. A, a very simple example was working in Iraq, 2003, 2004. I was responsible for reconstituting Iraq's Ministry of Interior and its internal security forces. I think it's a bit of an ongoing job. I didn't achieve it. Um, so how do you make sense of that? As a soldier, it was too dangerous for the police to do it. So, the Department of Defense of, of, of the United States government were given the job and I was seconded as a Brit to work for an American organization. And um, I was using science, I was using political science, I was using social science, I was using physics to try and make sense of the complexity, the ambiguity um, of this asymmetric space we were working in. Um, but I'd also bring in things like cultural studies, part of social sciences. History, I mean, fundamental. We look at Afghanistan today. You know, are, are we simply failing to have learned the lessons of history? You don't solve Afghanistan in 20 years. Um, so I see the two of them go hand in hand. And, and the, um, the, the role of, of the scientists, whether they be physical scientists or social scientists, is to create frameworks and research to support the practitioners to make sense of today's problems, um, to have a utility to the practitioner, to be available to the practitioner. And most practitioners I've worked with, and indeed as one myself, would bring in thought leaders to form our sort of support group, if you will, um, to, to enable us to especially bring in some cognitive diversity, getting us to think differently. And so, Security is a complex, ambiguous idea. Um, I, I was deeply moved by the UNDP in 1994, introducing ideas that moved away from territorial security to human security, ideas of freedom from fear and freedom from want, um, especially as I just spent six months um, in Bosnia as part of the United Nations, failing to deliver freedom from fear and freedom from want. And it, enabled us to crystallize our thinking. So again, I emphasize the utility of science in enabling security practitioners to make sense of what it is they're trying to do. Thank you, Kevin.
Brian, thank you very much indeed. That was very, very good. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, brilliant, 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 brilliant. Well, look, questions already flooding in. So I, without further ado, I'm going to uh, come. I'll come to you first, Kevin, if I might. And you and Grant's got a question about the nature of security studies. And uh, I wonder whether I could just expand his question a bit because uh, there's some other questions coming with overlapping this. And it goes like this, to, to, and I'll come to you, Brian, straight after, if I might. To what extent our current approaches to science, security science, either insufficiently drawn from police military studies and focus on police military, or insufficiently drawing from police and military studies. Perhaps if I can come to you first, Kevin, and then I'll ask the same question to you, Brian, straight after. That's a, a really difficult question. I think there are some excellent programs out there. Uh, I think there are some uh, excellent um, journals and publications out there. Um, but unfortunately, everything is driven by um, uh, by economics, and, and unless there's a, a, a very good margin or profit um, in something, it, it's very difficult. I, I, there's a number of fantastic graduate programs uh, in universities. Uh, for example, there's, a, 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 like I said, a number of great um, journals, but cost is an issue. And um, a lot of employers around the world and a lot of uh, organizations are not always willing to uh, support their people in terms of getting these academic uh, uh, credentials or using uh, these uh, re uh, written resources that are out there. So I think there's good information out there, um, it, but it, as they be, if they become more uh, accepted in terms of, of being funded, then I think we can expand that a, a lot um, in terms of uh, programs and in terms of um, uh, publications. Okay, thank you. Um, let me come to you, Brian. And uh, Brian, because of your background, particularly interested in the military studies, bit, or war studies, I'm, I'm, I think they're, they're separate subjects, sorry, but of course, but, but to what extent uh, um, are we drawing too much or insufficiently from those bodies of knowledge, which of course are, are relevant body, bodies of knowledge? Yeah. Um, I, one of the things that was fascinating when I was thinking about this, this period, I, I was um, reflecting on, as Kevin clearly did, the, um, the programs that are out there. And, and I go back to Clausewitz on, on art or science. So if you go to University College London or Cranfield University, you will do science degrees in security studies. Uh, if you go to King's College London, you'll do arts degrees in uh, military security studies. Um, so, so I think that's quite interesting. And they both take a slightly different view, um, whether it's an art or a science. Um, so I would say that was the first thing you need to understand your own ontology, how you make sense of the world in terms of your approach to find a program that will suit the way you make sense of the world you like to study. Um, I, think, I think that's important. I think it, it's quite interesting how you know, we, we, we communicate through language and how the use of language has sort of tilted and changed the way we think about the subject. So when I was a, a, a young office in the British Army, we did something called war studies and universities did war studies. You could go to Oxford, Cambridge, Aberystwyth, St. Andrews, King's, UCL and study war studies. Then they became peace studies because war became a bit politically incorrect. Um, and those peace studies have now transitioned into security studies. Um, and, and they embrace the same things that peace studies and war studies embrace under a different banner. So. I think that also leads to externals looking in to a degree of cynicism about you know what is security you know I mean is it economic security is it human security is it environmental security is it um, security of your computer systems cyber security you know what, what are we talking about and, and so it's an ever expanding and growing idea which I think does confuse um, so I think it's really important to understand how do you make sense of a concept of security? And working with the police and the military in my current role at Cranfield University, um, it, 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 
it's not so much that the military and the police, or indeed the security services who we work with, think differently about security. It's how individuals' ontology makes sense of it. And I think that's quite an important thing to understand. If, yeah, if that thank helps. you very much. Yeah, no, very much so. Very, very much so. It's a, um, it's a very interesting way. I, I like the way you, you make the connection about how the subjects about war, peace, security. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Let me just um, um, come to them a slightly different way. Now, Mark uh, Budry, I'm going to come to you, Kevin. Mark Budry, who's himself uh, um, a thinker about these, these sort of issues and has contributed himself. Um, and it's about the way in which we build science. And there's a tendency, I think, to interpret it as being uh, from doing research and then uh, and findings. And I wonder, and Mark's point is, can we build theory from practice as opposed to practice from theory? Because it is a world that's largely led by practice, or has been, Kevin. It's been um, led by practice first and the sort of... Um, uh, uh, it's almost as if uh, security professionals around the world say we're going to be doing it anyway, regardless of whether it's a science or not. And uh, it's up to the science to catch up and sort of prove them they're right. Is there a way in which uh, we can use practice to feed theory in a meaningful way? Or perhaps that's, ha that, that's exactly what has happened. Your thoughts first, uh, Kevin, and I'll come to you. Same question, Brian. Absolutely. In, in the world of security, we, we really need to approach this from both directions. The science needs to be informed by both theory and practice. And I think, uh, uh, I, I think Brian would agree that a lot of our academic programs uh, take that approach. They, they combine theory and practice. Where, where those two meet is where we educate, or, uh, I, I, I believe, in this field. It's, it's different from the field of engineering where it's more here's the theories and then they're put into practice through, um, through science and, and education. In the world of security, it's, it's more of an intersection where we have to take that practice and, and combine it with the theory and sort of uh, throw them in a, a bowl and mix them all together. Uh, it, it, that's, that's a very, very, very good point. Yeah, I mean, your thoughts on this, are a, a good question for you really, I, I guess, uh, um, given your background, Brian. Um, yeah. I mean, if you look at how theories evolve, they generally are academics studying practice and, and making sense of practice and, and giving it a term, whether that term be Cold War, you know, asymmetric war. Um, most of the, the terminology comes out of academia by studying and codifying practice. Um, and then the practitioners and, and I know very few practitioners, to be honest, who read academic journals, but they do read books. Um, the, the, and that's, uh, that is one of my criticisms of academic journals. They're not necessarily readable by practitioners. They're written in a foreign language. Um, the, 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 uh, the symbiosis, I think, of, of practice and theory are very important. And practitioners become better at practice by going back into theory and you know, using theoretical frameworks for sense making, especially in the um, the development that is going on in security at the moment. You know, how do you make sense of, of, of what they're calling mosaic warfare or asymmetric warfare? You know, these are sort of academics have given the new patchwork quilt of security a name, mosaic warfare, just bizarre. But and but within the study of that, th those who have been practicing security you know, have been seeing not beyond the horizon. And as they cross the horizon, discover a completely new context that they weren't prepared for. And I can think of many personal examples where that's happened. Where do you make sense of it? You, know, you go into the literature. So when I was going to Bosnia, I was traveling from Borneo, where I was commanding our jungle warfare school to Bosnia to join a UN force in, in armored infantry, utterly bizarre. Um, I didn't, to be honest, I wasn't even sure where Bosnia was. I knew where the former Yugoslavia was, but I wasn't quite sure where Bosnia was in 1992. So I found a book written by a guy called Michel Glenny about the Balkans. I read it and it helped me begin to understand the history of the place, you know, the different ethnic groups and so on. Um, and that informed my practice. So, so I think it's a symbiotic relationship between theoreticians and practitioners. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, let me move on to the next question. 
Um, and I'm going to combine two here because we've got one question which says, could the panelists tell us what they think about security? But I wonder whether I could ask you to do this in this context. Now, uh, I might get this name wrong, but if it took a Rasul, I'm sorry if I've got that name uh, not wrong, but the question's a good one. And Kevin, the question is this, and I'll do Kevin first and then Brian again. Um, uh, security has lots of different elements. So, and both of you have mentioned different elements in your opening statements. And the question is, can we have one set of theories that override the fact that it's always about an incident and a response? Or is there a need to involve specialism related to the different areas because they're so different. Uh, uh, um, uh, because if we could just have one theory of security, that's gonna make our life a lot more easily than if we're gonna say, aha, it's a bit more complicated than that and we need to think differently. Um, thoughts on that from, from, and of course, if you have got one theory of security, could you do it and it'd still be useful? Kevin first, then, then Brian, Kevin. Oh, that's another challenging one. <laughs> I know they are, Kevin. I've got to be honest. I'd have to say questions today have not been easy, but that's why we've got you two on board. Uh, I think we, we need to frame the overall um, security question in terms, and, and we can use an umbrella of security risk management. The whole concept of risk management, I think, over... Uh, overveils the, the entire world of security. There are many disciplines, many specialties, but it's, it's all framed in terms of risk management, I believe. And, and I think the whole concept of risk management is largely where a lot of the science and theory uh, is developing. Uh, and, and then it kind of filters down to, through the disciplines. One of my concerns kind of along the line of, of what the question got at was today's um, uh, tension, uh, as I put it, between uh, traditional security and cybersecurity. And it, it seems like both of them are trying to take over and we, we need to get away from that from a scientific perspective, kind of work together uh, in, in a collaborative spirit. And I think that's a very, very important goal that we need to follow in that role. We, we saw a similar thing, I think, uh, in, in past years with Homeland Security. It was all about Homeland Security, but nobody really knew exactly what Homeland Security was. And now it's all about cybersecurity. So we need to, I think we need to step back and look at everything in through the lens of risk management and I think if we do that, we'll be in a much better position to advance the uh, the profession. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. That makes sense to me. Brian, your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I, I think because it involves human beings and human beings are irrational and keep changing their minds, you will never have a single theory. Um, I mean, I've spent many years studying the concept of leadership. You know, there are as many definitions of leadership as a lot of people have attempted to define it, said a great American academic uh, called Ralph Stogdill. Um, if you Google, as I did just before this, security, you get 60,000 hits. Um, so it, it's a pretty contested concept of, as to what it is. Um, and so you're not going to have a single sort of theory. I think risk management is a great framework um, through which to examine it. But, but so is you know, historical studies. Um, you know, what is it that caused people to start killing each other? You know, what are the causes? Um, if we're going to understand that, we, we embrace the full spectrum of sort of academic fields, both social and physical sciences. So, um, uh, you know, neurology, you know, we're, we're learning more about the brain and, and how the brain influences our behavior. Um, so maybe neurology is an area we should focus on a little more to understand why people avoid Maslow's second part of his pyramid of hierarchy of needs, sort of security, um, why they become insecure. Um, so I think it's, it's a complex subject and I think you've got to embrace it with complexity and a degree of ambiguity. Um, and, and there isn't a silver bullet. That's my point. 
Yeah, no, I mean, uh, um, and I, this is this is this is the broad thing. I'm just putting together the Handbook of Security, the third edition, actually, where uh, over, over over forty chapters, well over forty chapters, actually. And of course, this problem with the Handbook of Security, which is supposed to be a sort of composite knowledge of the security world, is that every single subject has a potential relevance. I mean, every subject, art, uh, um, they do quite a bit of work on security, not much acknowledged. Every single subject can contribute. Is that broad and that dynamic? And they're in, uh, they're in the system. Okay, we'll come back to a minute. I want to get in a question from Mark Rowe. And uh, uh, Mark writes uh, um, extensively about security. Uh, um, and um, uh, he says, science needs data. Uh, um, but the truth of the matter is we don't know much about many of the things that we're tackling. He uses crime as an example. There are many crimes that we just don't know about. Uh, um, crimes that happen in the home, crimes involving which uh, uh, the victim and the offender are involved, drugs, for example. Uh, um, fraud offences are, uh, are greatly underreported. Um, and if you don't know about it, then clearly that limits the extent to which you can meaningfully engage in theorizing about it. And uh, um, is there, uh, question is, I suppose, uh, Kevin, do you agree that's a problem? And uh, um, does it get in the way of good science to the point it becomes useless or merely we need it to be guarded? Kevin first, then Brian, perhaps. All right, before I, I answer that, I, I wanted to, to uh, sort of, uh, echo uh, Brian's point that I really like that really when you come down to it this uh, the whole security world is all about people so we have to look at this from a, a, as a people issue and I, I, I really like that perspective uh, in terms of the data uh, that's very true one of our uh, age-old tenets in the world of security is that it's very difficult to show uh, return on investment or, or um, uh, or, or a value when you, you can't really define what you've prevented. So uh, the, the whole world of security kind of revolves around that, you know, uh, trying to uh, justify yourself even though you can't prove what you've prevented because nobody knows what, what could have happened if we weren't there, so to speak. So that's a very good point. Um, uh, and and as, as the questioner um, mentioned, it, it's the same thing with a lot of criminal acts. You don't know what would have been or could have been if there weren't security in place, if there wasn't law enforcement in place, if there weren't deterrence in place. Uh, so, so we can't really measure that. And it's very challenging to develop uh, good data sets because of that. So... Um, uh, so I think we use a lot of tools sort of to, to circumvent that. And uh, one of them is uh, we use um, scenarios, we use um, uh, uh, the data that we do have, that we do know about. Uh, and that comes from having uh, as best, uh, the, the best intelligence possible is what we need uh, in order to support that, that need for data or that, that th uh, hunger for data. So that's a very, very good question. Thank you very much. They're all good questions, I've got to say. Um, Brian, uh, um, let's bring you in on this. Uh, um, this is an issue, isn't it? This is the real world here that, um, but I guess that, but Brian, that would be true of any, any group really. There's always, uh, in any area of study, science isn't perfect in that respect. Your thoughts, Brian? Yeah, I, I mean, I, again, I, I go back to the ambiguous nature of, of security because it involves people. Um, and we, we try as, as scientists to, to shape problems as what Rittle and Weber in their paper in 1973 called tame or wicked problems. And, and we, we try and frame problems as tame because tame problems have solutions and we're trying to find a solution. Um, and we can only get solutions to problems that have solutions. And say, if you're an engineer, you've got to build a bridge. There's a way of building a bridge and, and actually the, the, the success of your building of the bridge is self-evident. The bridge works. If you take something like security, it sits within what Rittle and Weber called a wicked problem. There is no solution. Um, you're managing um, the, the, the problem without developing a solution, but, and you're ameliorating the impact of the problem on the stakeholders impacted by the problem, but you can't solve it. I mean, crime is, is another example. And so you've got to understand you can't you know, that no nation state has ever been secure on the planet, 
no group of people have ever been secure on the planet indefinitely. So you've got to understand the problem and understand how to handle the problem, recognizing you can't solve it. And I, I think that's, that's the first mindset. And then when you're trying to accrue data to analyze the problem, I've also found that, that, that data collection systems can drive very strange behaviors. You know, you, Vietnam, of course, the, the concept of the body count, you know, how do we lose a war when we won every battle? Yeah, because that wasn't the point that Giat was pursuing. Um, and, and, and equally, the, um, the concept of, uh, with the United Nations in Bosnia, um, the United Nations decided to monitor the, the level of violence. They wanted data on violence. So the data was explosions and gunshots and artillery shots. So most of the UN were not protecting people. They were counting bangs to feed data into the United Nations headquarters, which drove a whole series of very strange behaviors. Um, and so I, I think we've always got to be rather careful about the point of gathering data and, and how we use it and the behaviors that, 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 can, that can lead to. Um, but I, I, I commend, again, this is my academic head, I, I commend these sort of frameworks for sense making and tame and wicked problems um, are absolutely excellent. And there, there are quite a lot of papers written on styles of leadership and management required to deliver managing a, a wicked problem, solving a tame problem, but never reframe them. In fact, in their paper, they say it's immoral to um, reframe a wicked problem as a tame problem. And, and I've seen that phrase by those two American authors you know, lived out on the ground where people try and reframe an intractable, insolvable problem as a solvable problem, um, which often leads to a bigger problem. Yeah, really, really interesting point. I must say, I'd not heard of the Wicked uh, Tame one. It's uh, uh, an interesting little um, uh, um, explanation. It's a Let great paper. I'll send you a copy of it afterwards. OK, thank you very much indeed. Um, um, I tell you a subject that I was going to raise anyway, and uh, Mark Beard has done it for me. This, uh, as I say, I'll be putting together the Handbook of Security and getting authors around the world. There's a chapter on the professionalisation of security written by um, uh, Mike Gibbs and Alison Wakefield. <laughs> America and Britain and practice and academic combining and uh, uh, about whether security is a profession. And uh, uh, Marx asked this uh, um, um, in his own right. And he said, uh, um, as, a, as a profession, if there is one, we draw on theory from other disciplines. Uh, to what extent does, do we need more theory in our profession to advance further uh, in order to be recognized as a standalone subject? And I wonder whether, for example, security science or security studies, whatever you want to call it, would you consider that a separate identifiable area of study with its own distinct body of knowledge? Or would you consider it various subparts of other things as you both uh, mentioned today? Uh, Kevin, your thoughts first, please. Okay, you're, you're talking about security as a, a distinct field? Yes. Uh, of study of theory yes as, a, as a, so right so and i guess the point is this that that if you're going to have a profession and you were you were you were supporting the case for a profession yes uh, and and as you said it needs a it needs a body of knowledge and i wonder to what extent that's a distinct body of knowledge you could say this is about security or is it just drawn from lots of other things and we're just trying to amalgamate it all into one place at one time and how successful are we having done that given where we are. I need you both to be brief because we're running out of time. And I would like to get you both in on this. Kevin first. Very good. I, I, I really think that we, uh, we need to uh, incorporate the theory and the application. And I, I think it is a distinct field. I think, um, and, and I think to say it's not distinct uh, would, would dis, um, really reduce the value of the whole concept again of risk management. This is a, a very important uh, function that needs to be performed. And I think it is uh, distinct in terms of based on its own theory set and its own practice set. Okay, I, I wanna, I wanna uh, Brian, in, in putting the question to you, just uh, allude to the fact that uh, uh, you said that it could be about leadership, it could be about war and peace studies, it could be about uh, 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 
political, social science. I mean, you've mentioned a lot of things. I wonder whether you would also agree that it's a distinct area of study or not. Brian? Yeah, I think that's a really difficult question. And it's, it's, it's a very controversial question in the literature as well. Um, I, I would like it to be, if I'm honest, I think it is, an, it is a distinct area of study, but I, I, and it has its, its body of knowledge, but I think it leaks out into so many other areas. Um, and you could call it you know, the study of insecurity rather than the study of security. Um, it, it's because that's generally what we study rather than security. Um, but it, it, you know, it, it works across, again, what sort of security, economic security, you know, climatic security, I think it's gonna be a big thing in the future. You know, everyone getting upset with other people for damaging the global climate. Um, so I, I think it, it sort of leaks out into many other areas, international relations being a, a classic one. Um, so I'd like it to be a distinct area of study, but I think if you try and frame it as a unique area of study uh, to the exclusion of things you don't want to study because they're not security in your definition of security, I think you would be failing intellectually to grapple the complexity of the subject. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, they are difficult questions. They're very good questions, I must say. Um, one final comment from each of you. I'm going to ask you to be brief. Uh, um, Kevin, you mentioned we needed some sort of initiative uh, uh, to be done. And um, I notice in the questions, there's, a, there's some thoughts about what that might be. Um, perhaps I could ask each of you this very brief, if you wouldn't mind, just 30 seconds at the most each. Um, what, what is the next step in the re in the process of developing the security body of knowledge? Uh, Kevin, what sort of initiative do you want to see? Uh, I, again, I, I think that someone has to take the lead on it. I, I would recommend ASIS International as the largest uh, professional association for security management. And uh, we need to determine whether we're going to look at security uh, science or security management science, and then develop some sort of uh, a, a joint initiative with other professional associations that are allied with, with our uh, arena. And I, I really wanted to echo again what Brian said, and that one of the things that frustrates me most uh, when uh, we talk about security uh, and, and functions that blend, go into it is when people, so security professionals say, well, that's not security. Well, yeah, it is. We're managing risk for, so an organization can perform its mission, bottom line. Thank you very much. And Kevin, Brian, final comment from you on this, please. I think, I think it has to devolve to, to governments and, and their national research councils, um, both to encourage researchers in academia to study the subject and for practitioners to also record the, the, the reality of their experiences. So, so I'd like to see more money spent by governments through their research councils in the study and the research into security. Brian, Kevin, thank you so much. And thank you very much indeed to the audience for the questions. We've uh, run out and we could have go on. I mean, fascinating topic. And it was some excellent, excellent issues covered. Kev Kevin's quite right. These were were not easy questions. They're very, very good ones. And uh, uh, for sure, this is something that we will be coming back to in few future webinars. So thank you very much indeed for uh, for your input. Just a few final comments from me, if I might. Um, just to say that the Outstanding Security Performance Awards uh, entries close in Norway on Monday, in Germany on Monday week. They're still open in Australia, Romania, United Kingdom and in Ireland. So you need to get your entries in. Don't waste your time. Don't let it fly by. Get your entries in as soon as you can. Also to let you know that we, myself and my colleagues are gonna be out on the road soon. We're gonna be at the security event from the 7th and 9th of September. We're gonna be International Cyber Expo from the 28th and 29th of September. And we're gonna be at GSX Travel Permitted, of course, from 27th to 29th of September. So we hope to see you there. We've got booths at each of them and we'd love to, uh, love to get to see you there. Uh, and finally to say that uh, we'll be going through it all over again next Thursday, when our topic will be, what are the security implications 
of cryptocurrency and are they being managed? Well, this is in the news almost every day at the moment. So I do, if you'd like to be involved in that, let me know. If you'd like to be a panelist, let me know. Don't forget today's was suggested by uh, Andre and I'm very grateful to him for that. Uh, he certainly sparked an interesting debate. So once again, thank you very much indeed to my panel. Thank you once again to you, the audience. Thank you in the background to Christine Brooks and Hannah Miller for keeping it all going. Uh, hopefully I'll see you next Thursday. But until we meet again, wherever you are in the world, stay safe.